The BS Report is a free-flowing conversation that occasionally touches on mature subjects. First of all, this is the BS Report with Bill Simmons. It might be cool, I don't know. And if it's not, I don't care. The BS Report with Bill Simmons. Bill Simmons works for ESPN. He's also named the sports guy, and he writes a comical sports column. He must be a popular dude. The BS Report. It's got a real dirty sound. Like a rusty steak knife cutting through a well-aged steak. No. 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 Here's Bill Simmons. Yeah. All right, we continue our series of BS reports from the Sloan Conference in Boston, Massachusetts, my favorite city on the planet. Eric Mangini, <laughs> now of ESPN, joining us. We we get along now, the two of us. I didn't know we, we didn't get well, along. It's... So it was, it was it's one sided. It was, might have been one sided, yeah. but we're yeah. all good now. Okay. So you just finished your um, your first full season as an ESPN person, talking mm-hmm. head personality. What'd you think? Uh, there's some things I really liked, and some things that that were hard hard to to talk about in terms of the hypotheticals of hypotheticals. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Where they say, well, if this were to happen and then this were to happen, what do you th- where do you think this player should go? Right. Or, or any of those different scenarios. And to me, it's probably never going to happen. You know, yeah. there's no real... I understand why it's interesting. It's just hard to to provide a meaningful context to those types of... Because sports fans love hypotheticals. No, I, I, I get that, and coaches hate them. Yeah. So it's... Uh, uh, I appreciate why they're being asked, but that's that's one of the things that's been a little tougher for me, I think. Yeah. Well, I know from my vantage point, the first time I saw you on one of the shows, and I was like, this guy's not bad. And then I was watching more, and I was like, this guy's pretty good. And then mm-hmm. watch more, and I'm like, this guy's solid. Like, I was surprised. Does it... Is it almost like insulting that people that somebody would be surprised you'd be good on TV? I feel like that's insulting. Well, it, it is in the sense, of, but but I took a pretty serious beating in terms of of uh, you know how I was I think perceived from a a public standpoint as being the coach who's just yeah. because I didn't share a lot of information and right. and look I went from New England where I had done one press conference yep. ever when I was defense coordinator and it was in the middle of August. There's about six people there, and they really weren't that interested in what I had to say. It was before there was yep. mandatory coordinator press conferences to being the head coach of the Jets. Yeah. And my first press conference there, there's 100, 150 people there, 20 cameras, and it's like having kids. You tend to do what your parents taught you to do, or you know, you saw as, as you yeah. were being raised. And my football parents were, were Bill Parcells and, and Bill Belichick, and there was a, a, a way that, that those things were approached, and um, you know, that's, that's kind of what, what you learn. And, and it's a little bit of who are you to feel like you can do it better than they did it, or you're going to have a better rationale right. than they did it. But what I learned over time is you just got to do it the way that's right for you. And I think I got to that later in New York and, and in Cleveland, but after there's a perception it's much harder to overcome that perception you know even even if you have change it does seem like we always forget there's such a giant learning curve with a coach you know and you look at what happened with Belichick in Cleveland the Cleveland fans still hate him and think that he sucks even though he's won three (laughs) Super Bowls Um, and you go to that second team you learn from all your mistakes with the first team it actually felt like with the Browns am I I'm old. I might be forgetting this, but wasn't that team kind of playing well in your last year? Well, I, I thought we played well in both years in, in spurts, and and it, it's like anything else. You you go in with a plan, and your plan isn't a two-year plan. Yeah. You know, it's a longer-term plan. And when you talk about things, and you make decisions, you want to make good organizational decisions that's gonna that are gonna set you up to be competitive year in year out. Yeah. But People want it, you know. They want you to to cook a turkey, but they want you to cook it in a microwave, and it doesn't work like that. Like you have to, mm. you, you've got to have the time to 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 put things in place. And and with any new situation, it's going to be bumpy. And you either deal with the criticism and you deal with the the down times in order to set yourself up for long term future success, or you say, hey, we're just going to sell out everything this year to try to win right now yeah 
But oftentimes, that's, it's not sustainable. It's not a sustainable model. Was it a bad thing that you got that job that early? Like, in retrospect, do you wish you had stayed, like, an extra year with the Patriots? And then maybe, um, do you feel like it was too soon for you? I don't know, because I don't think that anybody... Like, how old were you? I was 34, I think. I guess that's, that's a fair age. Yeah, I, at the time, I was the third youngest ever. I but believe. tough city to be 34-year-old first-time coach. Yeah, it, it's it's tough being a first-time coach, regardless of what city you're in, because there's no there's no manual. They don't give yeah. you a head coaching manual. You're not trained on how to be a, a head coach, and things come up. I remember sitting in that chair and thinking, oh, okay, now I see why Bill did this. Yeah. Okay, now I see why Bill Parcells did this. Whereas an assistant. You're thinking, what, what are they doing? Why are they doing this? I, this? It made no sense. And it did when I was there. You mm-hmm. know, it's like, oh, oh, okay. And there's always five things that come up in the course of the day that you don't plan for. So you go in with your schedule, and this is what you want to achieve on that day. But something comes up that you're just like, I, I've never dealt with this. Yeah. I have no idea what to do here. Would, uh, in Cleveland, you didn't really have a quarterback that was... I would say above average. The Jets. I'm trying to remember Pennington. Yeah, I, th- I think Chad, Chad did played a good, pretty well that good year job. for you. And, you know what we did with with Brett Favre is it was one of those situations where we agreed, myself and Mike and and Woody that we were going to bring Brett in and and we understood that it was a short term answer. We were on the verge of opening up a new stadium and the the concept was take a shot and at the end of the year it you know would see where we are. But we were going to continue with with the plan. Yeah. And we went eight and two or eight and three, whatever it was. And unfortunately, Brett's arm got dinged up, and we weren't quite the same at the end of the year. And it's like anything else; you may have a certain plan at the beginning of the season, but at the end of the year, when when you're eight and three at one point, you know someone has to someone has to go. Did you find yourself rooting against the Jets the following year? Uh. It's, I would have done that. I'm hugely <laughs> spiteful, though. I definitely well, would have been like, screw well, those guys. It, this is the tough part of that is a lot of those coaches stayed. Yeah. A lot of the people in, whether it was the medical staff or the scouting staff or PR, were people that I was part of hiring. And you felt like the, you had built the foundation. The players we brought in were all yeah. guys that I cared about. Mm. So do you want them to be successful after you leave? You know, human nature is is no. But then there's a bunch of people that you really like, yeah. And you really want to see, especially the players, well, the coaches too. But it's like these are young guys that you brought in that you developed to see them, you know, blossom. Like Darrell Revis, Nick Mangold, DeBrickshaw Ferguson, those guys that it's like, all right, this this is great to see. If I was your buddy, I probably would have said, dude, you're going with. The Jets, one of the most tortured fan bases on the planet. And then it's like, hey, it's the Browns. There's the most <laughs> tortured sports city in the planet. Like, kind of feels like your next job should be like Jacksonville or so, somewhere <laughs> where there's like, you just leave you alone for a couple of years and let you do your thing. Well, what you don't want to do is, is be the cleaner where you walk into, some, you know, the, the guy from Pulp Fiction who comes in and takes care of all those yeah, problems. Yeah. And where you go in, you say, okay, well, the salary cap, you've got a problem there. And the That's building, what happened to you in Cleveland. The building needs to be revamped. Yeah. You know, there's problem guys there. And yeah. You say, okay, we're going to take these hits. And believe me, it's not popular. But if, if there's consensus that we're going to live through this together to get to a better place, yeah. then it's easier to make those decisions. But if that plan changes, it, it gets or a little... Or somebody new comes in who may take over and decide he wants this instead of that. And yeah, the whole thing. It, it gets harder. But I really believe in... in the things that we did, and, yeah. and one of it was was a commitment to a certain type of player. Yeah. And, and guys, you know, the media has heard me say it a, a thousand times, but I believe in this. And, and I learned this in Cleveland first when I was with Belichick there. I was in the locker room when they signed Andre Risen. I picked Andre Risen up from from the airport, mm. you know, because that was my you know, that moon. was my role in life. And so he was going to sign a contract and get a five million dollar signing bonus. And we're <clears> sitting in the limo. And there's a press conference scheduled, and we sat in that limo for an hour, and he didn't come inside. I'm like, Andre, we, you know, we got to go. We got to go. And made everybody wait, and, and it didn't work out, and the, the locker room imploded because players look at, okay, this is who you paid. That's what you value. Right. Then we go to New England, 
and we put an emphasis on, on character guys. And, and even in New York with, with Bill Parcells, the guys we brought in, character guys, and it's, it's truth in sports. You know, you, yeah. you get a bunch of selfless guys who don't care about who gets the credit that work together, you can do great things. So other things you believed in before you took your first coaching job, it sounds like you believe in them even more now that you've had the course that you've had with the two teams and saw what worked and didn't work. I, I know it works. Is that right? Because I see yeah. it every single year. It works where a player comes out who's got great potential. Why are you know, you should definitely take this player who's got great potential, he's got great potential. Guy comes in the league, he doesn't do anything, and everybody wonders, why didn't he do anything? Because he didn't have the character to back up that potential. Then you bring in these other guys that have great in, intrinsic uh, motivation and, and character, and suddenly average becomes good, good becomes great, and great becomes a Hall of Famer. Yeah. I mean, Tom he's Brady five, wasn't... Yeah, he's 5'8". He, does, he can't play in this league, but he gives a crap. But it's even Tom Brady. Everybody yeah. knows Tom Brady now. Right. But Tom Brady wasn't Tom Brady when we got him. He was a skinny six-round draft pick, and we do these post-practice workouts where... Um, no, he struggled. Yeah. But he worked, and he had character, and he showed leadership. So you saw that, that even when he was like backup dude. Yeah, you, that's that's why there was that that belief in him, and that's why he was given time. We carried four quarterbacks that first year he was there, yeah. and um, you know, but you just think like, oh, of course, it's Tom Brady. Well, part of what makes Tom great, Brady great is is his, who he is. Yeah. And he worked, and even now. And I'll say this about about Bill Belichick too: is regardless of how much success either of those guys had, they work at the same level. They weren't affected by the fame, the success. They come in and they work at the same level, you know, all the time. The Patriots won three Super Bowls with the Belichick Brady combo. Do you think that was the right amount? Should they have won more? Should well, they've they been won to two less? more. They've been to another right. AFC Championship game. I kind of feel game. like you can make a case they could have won seven. Or you could make a case they could have won two. I think the 3 4 ones were, they were the best teams those years. I don't think there's any doubt. 0-1, a couple breaks go in that Rams game, maybe they don't win that. 0-1, we weren't the most talented team. No. But we were the best team. That's the difference. Yeah. And that, to me, that experience there solidified my belief system in building a team and drafting players and bringing players in free agency more than any other experience uh, that I've had in sports because that's that's what it is, especially in football. It's it's about the team concept and whatever book you read on the Patriots, whatever you hear about the Patriots, the way the players talk, they talk in terms of team and it's not it's not just rhetoric. Right. It's it's a belief system. And that, I mean, you could say they had that belief system was much stronger from oh one to oh four than maybe what guys start to leave like do you realize that as it's happening, or do you realize that after the fact? Like, oh crap, we don't have as many of those guys as we had before. Like Willie leaves, and you know, I, all of a sudden there's a tipping point, right? Yeah. See, I I don't know a lot about all the the, the new guys that are there. I think they have one. Well, I'm talking about mid 2000s. Yeah, you know? but we won again in 2004. Right, and then we we went to the playoffs. Oh, five was Denver. Went to the playoffs. Which was a stupid loss. I I still feel like if we played Denver, I use we like I'm on the team. If we played Denver ten times that year, I think we win six. Yeah, and we had five turnovers. I mean, was there's it, a lot of stuff. That everything went wrong in that game that could go wrong. Yeah, was, and then the Colts game, to, in my opinion, was a worse loss than the Super Bowl of the Giants. Because to be up 21-3, it just think about how you're talking though. Talking about yeah. oh that AFC Championship game that was the worst loss. I know the the loss after the eight you know the 16 no season that was horrible. There's a lot of teams that would trade places. Oh yeah. For the level of success over time, that that's why the fans in Cleveland right now are swearing at me as they listen to this podcast. <laughs> like, are you really bitching about the AFC Championship game, Simmons? But hey, it's like it's it's a high. There's qu- probably five plays that could have swung another three Super Bowls. Like even that Giants game, like. The famous, the now infamous Welker Pass. Um, yeah, but those which, are those are high class problems. Yeah, you those, know, those are. are high class problems. Yeah, yeah, that's true. That's what. Uh, yeah. When you watch that Super Bowl, do you feel like the right team won? Super Bowl Forty Six. Um, I don't know. It, it, it's hard. Each game, because of the, all the Super Bowls that I was a part of. Yeah. They swing on about five plays. Yep. You know what I mean, and and that's it's a handful of plays that that swing a game, and uh, 
Marty Schottenheimer told me that a long time ago. He's like, look, Eric, every game is going to swing on five plays. So it could have gone either way. It easily could have gone either way. Well, it's, I wrote this a couple weeks ago. This was a really weird season in that I feel like the Patriots could have won the Super Bowl. Absolutely, a couple plays go. Ravens. Evans just cradles it. Now they're in the Super Bowl. Who knows with them? Who Niners. Knows, who knows if he if the field goal is successful? What happens after oh, that? Oh, yeah, true. You know? Niners. Mm-hmm. Guy doesn't touch the punt or fumble the other one. Maybe they maybe Eli finally makes a mistake in overtime, whatever. They were right there. The Saints were right there. And the Packers had one of those games like the 05 Broncos Patriot game where it's just everything went wrong in that game for them. And uh, the Giants gained momentum, but did feel like six teams could have potentially won with some breaks this year. Maybe remember, that's what the league I, is I now. I remember in 2001, okay, David, we're playing Buffalo, and I believe it was overtime. So I know what you're going to say, the helmet. They, yeah, the David helmet Patton advanced. gets knocked out. Yeah. His helmet's out of bounds. His foot's touching the ball. I mean, sometimes you just, that yeah. just breaks your way. Somebody, I can't the remember. The snowball, you know, the, the tuck rule. Oh, and yeah. Sometimes yeah. those things just break your way. Somebody was telling me, I can't remember where I heard this. Must have been, I can't remember, but they were saying that at some point during one of those seasons, you know, and the whole team gets confidence, like, this is happening for us. Like, we can feel it. And you just start to feel like every break can go your way. And it didn't feel like that happened in 2001, to some degree. Well, it, during that run, you'd sit there in the fourth quarter, and there was never a sense of panic. It didn't yeah. matter whether you're behind or not behind, because you were going to win. Yep. Because that's what's supposed to happen. Right. And and you just it was just understood. Everybody just went back to the bench, said, Okay, this is where we are now, this is what we have to do, but we're gonna win. And and uh, that confidence is a tremendous, tremendous asset. So where does it go? You just you lose one tough game and it just vanishes? No, I don't think it's one tough game. It's the same thing with losing. Mm. Sometimes you're ahead in the fourth quarter and if your team isn't used to to, to winning, yeah. there's almost that mentality of when's the other shoe going to drop? Yeah. What bad thing is going to happen here as opposed to saying, no, this is going to happen. We are going to make this happen. And it's uh, to say what the tipping point is either way, I don't think anybody's ever identified that. But when you have it one way or the other... You know it as it's you, happening. You can yeah. feel it. Yeah. Yeah, you can feel it. So... The Browns right now are in a really interesting spot. I think they have the fourth pick. They've needed a quarterback since forever, since Bernie Kosar. I, mean, I can't even remember the last great quarterback. They could trade up two spots and pay a King's ransom and get Robert Griffin the third, who would be instantly the first signature guy that team's had in forever. Would you do that if, if you were them? Do they need somebody like that? Here's what I'll say about these, these questions is if you feel – that Robert Griffin III is a franchise quarterback, which means each year he's going to give you a chance to compete for a Super Bowl, then there's no price too expensive to pay for that guy. I totally agree. Okay. Now, if you're wrong, it is the last quarterback you are ever drafting. <laughs> That's what it is. You go yeah. all in. Because if, you, if you're right, you're going to be there a long time. He's going to win a ton of games. And if you're wrong... He's going to outlive you, and the next coaching staff will coach him, and the next GM. So you know, it's a World Series of Poker, and you're just going. Yeah. That's it. it. You, that, that's your move. And and I didn't realize this at the time when we brought in Brett Favre and, and signed as many free agents as we did. You know, that's what we were doing. Well, right. that's what I was doing. In a roundabout way. Yeah, yeah. You, you just slide yeah. your chips in, and and you go all in. And I, that's that's the reality of it. But there's could, this assumption that Robert Griffin III, and I'm not knocking Robert Griffin III. Yeah. I'm just saying there's this assumption that he's going to be the next great quarterback. But there's an assumption that Sam Bradford was going to be the next great quarterback. And he still might be. But right now, he, he, he's done some good things. But it's not like he's elevated that franchise, you know, to, 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 to great heights. And every year, you know, Ryan Leaf, Demarcus Russell, the, the league is littered with them. So it's it's nice to think that just add this player and we'll be great, but it's, it's a, not a guarantee. Here would be my counter to that, because I think Griffin is going to be a, a huge star. Would you um, bet your job on him? I think I would, and here's why. Because if you were making that decision, you would be. I would do it. Okay. I would do it, and here's why. I think the way the league is going, 
I think that kind of quarterback is just the biggest advantage you can have. If you have somebody that, you know, in the old days, if you had a quarterback that ran around, that you get physical with that guy and you take shots at him after. Like now, it's like those guys just don't. If they can move around and avoid that kind of punishment, you know, you know, you're getting 16 games a year out of him. You know, he can create plays with his legs. Oh, yeah, yes and no, because sometimes Why? those guys that move around get hit they get a lot hit more. Seven yards down the line. And scrimmage. Michael Vick has, has missed a lot of games, and there's been a lot of of mobile quarterbacks over time that that do great things with their legs and put a lot of pressure on the defense. Right. But to me, where the, where those guys are most effective is if they can operate in a conventional sense, everything that they do unconventionally yeah. is that much more of a problem to deal with. And that's what the biggest shocker with Cam was last well, year. Well, that, that's the yeah. greatest thing that he did is because he could operate from the pocket, which made everything else he did so much more special. But if all you can do, if your natural default is to run with the football – and that's your answer to most problems. Odds are, at some point, that it just it reaches a, a ceiling. But I, see, I feel like he can do both. Like to me, Griffin. I don't. I know people love comparing Griffin to Newton because they came a year apart and a little bit similar of what they're trying to achieve. But he reminds me. It's a little more Aaron Rodgersy for me because I feel like he could stay in the pocket and scamper around when he needs to. But when he scampers, all of a sudden you're running a four-four-one. Right, but part of scampering, too, is how well do you make people miss? Yeah. Because there's a lot of guys who are straight line fast yeah. who can't make people miss and take huge hits. So you need both of those things. It's not just being fast. It's being quick. And, and I think one of the things that Cam Newton does really well is, for, especially for a guy his size, is he can make people miss as well as is fast. Yeah. Doesn't star power matter at all with quarterbacks? I feel like it does. There's a certain charisma that a guy has. You don't, you know. You know what star? Did, did Tom Brady have any star power? But he's got a charisma to him. Now he does. Now he does. <laughs> you yeah, think he everybody. had an 0 one? I felt like he had an 0 one. Do you think anybody else in the world thought that? Got drafted in the sixth round. Does it matter when you're drafting him? No, it matters when they come in, and it's not about the star power. If they're good, they're going to be stars, and that's true in any position. I we're we're going to make them stars. The, you know, the world is going to make them a star because they're successful. They don't come in necessarily. Them being a star doesn't necessarily mean they're going to be successful. I knew after the game, Drew gets hurt at the Mo Lewis game. Mm-hmm. I think like either the next week or two weeks later, the Pats scored like 45 or some. Remember we, that? It was at home. We beat the Colts, who were. It was a blowout game. Yeah. No, we had two interceptions for touchdowns. Tom was good in that game, though. I remember thinking, like, ooh, I like the way this guy carries himself. You know we scored three offensive touchdowns in playoffs that season. I'm well aware. It, well, that's what I'm saying. It's like, But nobody it, has a Super Bowl team ever had worse skill position players than that team. Antoine Smith is a running back. Patton, Troy Brown was the only above-average skill position guy in the entire team. Uh, David Patton, you did. I thought David Patton was, was you give pretty him good. Above average, if he's your number yeah, one, like well, he's on the very low end. But what? I, what you, he had outstanding vertical the speed, tight end? very good waved. change of direction. What about the tight end? Oh, what was uh, it? Uh, Jermaine Wiggins. Jermaine Wiggins, who caught forty passes in Boston, the snow game. Right? Yeah, he yeah. got waved the next summer. Nobody even picked him up. Great hands, unbelievable hands. He was unbelievable in the snow game. Yeah, it's a. Uh, uh, I, I think again, it goes back to. You know, team, team. You know, we beat Pittsburgh. We blocked a, what did he block a field goal for a touchdown? They returned a punt. Drew comes back in, throws the touchdown after Tom gets hurt. Yep. You know, just that's. That was my favorite random part of that whole run was that Drew, who really had gotten the shaft that season to no fault of his own, he gets hurt. He's like a life-threatening thing. Tom comes in, wins over the city. Brady versus Bledsoe becomes his thing. And it becomes clear they just got to ride the Brady thing. And Drew was just not a part of anything that was going on. And then he had his moment where he got to save that game. He had the one great throw. Yeah, the, I think it was the David Patton in the corner of the end yeah, zone. Yeah, it was a great throw. Yeah. I it, mean, was it was, it was uh, what, what was so special about that whole season, again, goes back to the, you know, what we all think about as, as little kids with, with football and the idea that everybody contributes, the the selflessness, the I remember we'd, I'd come in and um, you know guys would be kidding each other about who got in earliest to work out, right? Who hydrated the best? 
who studied the hardest. And when you've got that, it it's special. Who's the single biggest leader or single best leader that you remember from that whole run? Or that, how about this? Who's the single best leader you've seen since you've been working in the league? Wow, that's... Was there a force of personality guy that I mean, just I, overshadowed? I, I love Rodney Harrison. I yeah. love Teddy Bruschi. Um, there's so many guys from that team, you know, Seymour, Willie, um, Tom, Troy. I mean, Troy Brown, okay. He. I remember when we went to him to play DB, 12 years in the league or whatever yeah. it was, and he was going to be a role player, and he approached that with no ego, no concern about his legacy. He was like, well, okay, you know, I'll... I'll, I'll I'd love to do this. I'd love to help out. Studied. Yeah. Played more defensive snaps than offensive snaps that year. Like when you've got guys like that. Oh, Mike Vrabel. Mike Vrabel. I mean, I, I'm sure I'm forgetting guys that. Yeah. You know, there's, there's so many of them. Otis Smith. Did you feel like what uh, Belichick did with this year's Patriots team kind of felt like they overachieved a little bit? Yeah. Especially I, when you look at their defense. I mean, you thought I ran into you. We we talked. We hashed out our whole. Thing we had never met you before. We got over our whole thing, and um, that was one-sided, though. Was I didn't it totally realize there was, was yeah. I had no animosity. I'm a diehard Patriot fan. What do you want from me? It's okay. Um, and you told me the Ravens are either going to beat the Patriots or come really close. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, what are you talking about? We're going to kill these guys. I like, know. And you listed out these 19 football reasons. Mm-hmm. And of course, I'm like, you know, I'm like, all right, that now I'm worried because those were like real reasons that. And you were right. I mean, it came, like, damn close losing. And then the Giants game, same thing. Um, probably it feels like the weakest Patriots team that um, came that close of all the ones. Well, when you look at this team now, and I talked about this a lot in the beginning of the season, they, they went to a 4-3. Yeah. So you've got 10 years in a 34 system, and then you're transitioning to a 43. There's a lot that goes into that because the coaches have reps built up on coaching that defense as well. Yeah. And all the players that were there have reps built up on playing that defense. And when you play a different scheme, the answers don't come as quickly. You you haven't seen it as many times where when you've coached something for years and years, it's like, okay, they're doing this. Remember we'd had that in yeah, yeah. 2004. We fixed it this way. It's, it's, it's that kind of, of quick fix. So there was going to be growing pains with that no matter what. And there were a lot of injuries. There were a lot of moving parts. There were a lot of new players. Uh, you know, Haynes was, was there, and then he wasn't there. <sighs> that was terrible. Um, who was the corner that got released early Lee in the Biden. season? I mean, there, were a lot of, there was a lot of flux, and you, you have to give them credit for what they were able to succeed with all that adversity. Didn't Dan Copen get hurt early? Yeah. Nobody talked about that. Like nope. th- that's the other thing that you have to appreciate about about your team is Belichick. that when things happen, nobody sits on. there and bemoans, "Oh, we lost our starting center. Oh, we lost this guy that we thought was going to." And that's that's also the reason why you're giving it. You have a chance to compete every year, is because they're not distracted by those things. Yeah, the freaking Jets fans. They lost Nick Mango for like a month. Oh, we lost our center. <laughs> it's like, ah, we, we don't have a center, period. Like, at least you're getting him back. But it, it but it, it's, so it's that component. It's, you know, whether you're on a win streak or a losing streak, it's all the same. Yeah. It's a consistent approach because all you can control is that moment. If you're looking back or looking forward, you're not taking care of what you're supposed to take care of. But that's an art. Like, being able to get that many people to think that way, yeah. it's really difficult. Uh, the Giants fans that I'm friends with, who I might be breaking up with, I might just need to get rid of all the Giants fans in my life, but I've been saying, like, if we had Gronkowski, we'd win the Super Bowl. You know it. We can't. We almost beat you without Gronkowski. He was, I went to the game. He could barely get off the line. By the third quarter, they were defending him with Chase. What was the guy's name, the teacher? Uh, Chase Blackburn. Chase Blackburn who was a substitute teacher two months ago, now defending the be- the guy who just had the best tight end season of all time. Um, their argument was, well, if Gronkowski was playing, we would have opened it up more. Gilbride coached a terrible game. We, we tried to, we ran the ball all the time. We would have aired it out. We would have still, we would just would have won 35-31. What happens if Gronkowski plays? 
We're getting back into those hypothetical. I mean, you have to answer. Gronkowski did play. He and, was and forty percent. Okay, but you got to give Gronkowski. That's the other thing is you got to give that kid a lot of credit he's to play on a high ankle sprain like that. Tough ass dude. That that's hard, and I know he took a lot of heat for the dancing thing afterwards. Yeah, but it's but twenty three. You, you also a, kind of some slack. You got to appreciate what he did, which was really I totally agree really hard to do, and. You know, you could see it in the as he had actually in the first quarter is okay, but then obviously, and then by the third quarter, he was just could not get off the line. But it's, it's like anything else. There's going to be injuries yeah. all throughout the playoffs, and right, every team could go back and guy. say, "Hey, well, if this guy played, or this guy played, or if you know, we." And uh, I'm sure what they were talking about is it is what it is. If Victor Cruz had a high ankle sprain, I bet they don't win the Super from Bowl. UMass. UMass's own Victor Cruz. And James Ahedabu. The other thing that I think the Pats, it's just like all the shaky drafts that they had had came back to haunt them. You know, at that fourth quarter, Ocho Cinco's on the left side, and the safety's not even looking at him. And it's just the corner's on an island with him. Brady's not even looking at him. And he has the whole left side of the field to run. It never threw one pass to him. But, uh, you know, that was an Achilles heel for that Pats team. Gronkowski was the guy that stretched the defense. Once he well, got Aaron, taken out, that's it. Aaron Hernandez is pretty good, too. Right. And that was it. And then they realized, all right, well, they took him out of the game. I think they double teamed him in the second half, right? Uh, Most of the time? Probably. I, yeah. You know, my feeling going into the game was the way the Giants played in the first game was a lot of post-safety defense, Yeah. which means they had an extra player down the box. New England wasn't going to be able to run the ball very effectively. They were going to cloud up the middle of the field in between the hashes, which they did again, and where you have to win is outside. And... Um, you know, it was, it was a lot of the same in the Super Bowl. I mean, that's how they played in the first game. That's how they played in the second game. Yeah, to have a high-powered receiver, it, it's a good thing. All right, so Mike Wallace costs, a, let's say he costs a first-round pick this year and a conditional third that could become a second if the Patriots win a Super Bowl. And that's what it would cost to get him. Am I crazy, or with the Patriots, should they do that in a millisecond? Uh, I mean, this is a pretty deep class of free agent wide receivers, so you might be able to look at a lot of those different guys. But and, I could get Mike Wallace. I know Mike Wallace is good. Mike, our guy uh, Bill Barnwell and Grantland broke it down. Like his stats with Roethlisberger, he's basically 120 yards a game or something, and it's the best deep threat in the league. Okay, but it's, he's 25. It's, it's not just good. It's is he good for you? Yes, and that, and he's that's, good for us. No, I know, I know, I know, <laughs> I know that, that's another... My answer is yes. But, but that's another part of the philosophy is that oftentimes in the draft, you're going to say this player is a good player, yeah. but he's not good for us. So the key thing for, for New England... Like Donald or, Hayes is a good example. Or any other team is, okay, he's a good player. He's, not, he's just not good for us. So you're not, you're not discounting his value. So the, the key thing is... Is Mike Wallace good for New England? Yes. And part of that is figuring out, you know, where is he from a uh, ability to pick up scheme? That that's so important because it's going to be a lot of no huddle. They're going to have to understand how the protection works, how the site adjusts and hot work. When you come back with logic. No, but but that's how it is. Otherwise, you're going to sit here and say you go get some guy, you know, player X. Who can't pick up the scheme? Donald Hayes. Then Remember? we're gonna, we're going to be sitting here going, well, why didn't he work out? Right. He was over on that left hand side, and the safety didn't even look at him. Yeah. So you need the guy that's good. That's what makes Deion Branch so good. Yeah. That's what makes Wes Welker so good. Is not only do they understand the scheme, the offensive approach, they understand what the defense is doing. And where to go because that guy's here and this right. guy's shaded this the way. Oh, that leverage, means so I'm, I'm to the spot. I'm going to break with inside that's leverage. That's why that the famous Welker play. And I was sitting in the seat. I wrote about this. You could see it. It was going to break at the line of scrimmage. You could see it. He saw some inefficiency. He saw this guy was over here too far, and this cornerback was coming this way. And he just had that air, and he saw it, and he ran toward it. And Brady threw it a half second too early, and he lofted it too high. He just had a straight throw. It would have been a 30-yarder. Yeah, I mean, I, based on what I saw in films, it looked like it was three deep. It looked like he was running a seam route just inside the numbers. It looked like the safety was shading over it's further than far. normally would. Yeah. So the corner jumped up on the shallow route, which he shouldn't have. Right. So now Tom had a lot of space to throw to the outside. It didn't make any sense to throw a tight throw. He was trying to 
throw him into the space. That's the thing, he had the tight throw. If he had thrown it toward the sideline tight, Welker just goes and catches it and he goes down the sideline. But you're not you're not criticizing Tom's decision making, cr- are you? I am criticizing the fact that the play did not work out. <laughs> I know. I know. But I think if he had that throw it, again, he throws it differently. Okay, I think Wes Welker is gonna catch nineteen out of twenty of those. Yeah. Sometimes it happens. And I guess the is thing there, is, has there been a more reliable receiver in the last however many years? It was a really years? tough catch. It was right in front of me. I, I, like to I catch with shoulder pads and go over your head like that, falling backwards. Is he's not, made, everybody makes that catch. I know he's made a lot of them though. He so made, let's what, say what, he catches 121 it. of them last yeah. year. I just everyone in Boston blamed Welker, and I think it was a 50-50 thing. Well, look, that was one play. There's a lot of other plays in that game you can look to that say, hey, if we had done this. This well, the third happened. down play nobody talks about. He threw it a little behind Dion, but Dion still could have. Was like third and eleven. Yeah, was, there's, there's he another, was open there's on another the play. drop on the on, on the, the final drive. drive. Yeah. yeah, yeah, like those plays. Yeah, Pats fell apart. And defensively, you know, there were plays that could have been made. So I'm to, gonna, to sit there and say, I think. to say one guy, like yeah. it's his fault. That's not well, plus, fair. If, it's caught, not if right. Walker caught it, he gets tackled at fifteen. Maybe. Maybe the Giants stop him. We kick a field goal, and Eli still has enough time. Well, what to if do Mario something. Manningham doesn't make the catch he makes? It was a great catch. That's I know, what, basically what it came down to was those two plays. But what I'm just saying is, yeah. okay, Mario Manningham doesn't make that catch. You mean future, future New England Patriot Mario Manningham? I mean, is he right for Mike you? Mike Wallace, Mario Manningham, Wes Welker. We're ready. 16 and 0. Um, last thing, because we're at the Sloan Conference. Analytics. You you used a lot of analytics um, with the Jets mm-hmm. and the Browns. You feel like it's a flawed, to some degree, um, area that has value and yet can be overrated. Like, explain your thought process on it. No, I think it has real value. I think it has significant value. I think what happens is that the league, NFL, I think, is behind other sports in terms of incorporating analytics as a department. Yeah. As a as a part of the process, and um, you get into this pattern of things that you have to achieve during the course of the season, that there's not a lot of money spent and a lot of time spent on research and development. And I think that's an area that teams should do so much more in. Especially and, with how much money they make, just throw five million bucks at your analytics. We did a bunch of stuff in New York on, on performance enhancement, which is mental training based on the model they set up at West Point, and we were the only other team besides AC Milan to have a performance enhancement center. And, and all the time we talked to our athletes about move on to the next play. You, uh, make sure you envision this, um, you know, uh, be in a zone, all those different things. We always talk about it, but nobody teaches it. Yeah. Nobody teaches the athlete how to move on to the next play. That's interesting. Nobody teaches the athlete how to, how to get into a zone. And there, there's a whole new field based on mental training using biometrics, to me, which I think is, is the way of the future, because it's like anything else. I'm sure the first people that incorporated strength and conditioning, everybody's like, well, what are they doing that for? But as you lift weights, you see your muscles get bigger. The reason I like performance enhancement through bio, uh, biometrics is um, you get to see how your body is responding, whether it's heart coherence hmm. or looking at brain cortexes. This is this is like an emerging field. I, I think that has a lot of value, but it's going to take time to make it football specific. They do a ton of it with special uh, forces right now, and can it's, you it's some can of those they areas. potentially teach fans how to get over heartbreaking losses? I'm um, willing to be a test case. I think I think that's at what, some point I need to stop thinking about Super Bowl 46. <laughs> Yeah, at some point you're going to have to, and that'll probably Can be, they work on my brain cortex? Uh, we're going to have to do a lot of work, <laughs> just judging by our conversation. I'm just glad you got over our relationship that I didn't know was in peril. Yeah, well, you're a good dude. Okay. I'm, I'm, we're okay. Good, We've good. moved on. All right. Plus, the, the Giants won that year anyway, so that was... They legitimately won the game. I actually think <laughs> more about the 06 Colts game. Really? For just from... Uh, it's third and three. That's it. Brady, Detroit Brown, third and three. That's it. The Patriots should win that game. And so it's you've, kind got, of a, you've got your one play from that game. Oh, yeah. You've got the one play from How the Super Bowl. How about Ben Watson tackling Champ Bailey, and the ref can't decide whether it went over the cone or not. And if we get that call and it's a touchback, I still think we win that game. Yeah, I think it went over the cone, too. 
And then the uh, obviously the helmet catch was the worst of all of them, which the 14 holdings that were on. Now the Giant fans are complaining about there was a holding penalty right before the Pats got the ball back in SP46 um, in the corner. I think it was Manningham actually, and they are all saying if you got it, that would have been the the uh, payback for the helmet catch if you had gotten that. Non-call. But don't you think the Raiders fans are going to complain for life about the call they got? And, you know, All I can say is that call was was interpreted correctly by the officials on hand. Yeah, because That's you live here. For that. If you yes. live there, you may feel totally just like I'm sure the Denver f- fans feel that that yeah. official made the right rule. Uh, they can, go to, the they can go to hell. Uh, Eric Mangini, I'm sure we'll see you on uh, on our networks uh-huh. breaking down RG3 and Andrew Luck and Justin Blackman. And the whole crew. Talking in hypotheticals, even though you don't like it. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Appreciate it. So I get to sign off. Whoa. Thank you for downloading the BS Report with Bill Simmons. Too much fun. Check out more podcasts at the iTunes Music Store or at PodCenter at ESPNRadio.com. Peace out.